feels much more Oprah style with the microphone. Um, it's always interesting for me as somebody who's kind of a, a translator of complicated things to a wider public to come to academic environments. And um, I've, been giving, I've been giving thought for years about um, the impact of new technology on creativity. And the book... Um, I'm one of those people who I knew I saw ebooks coming. I, I knew they were going to happen, and um, I saw the the way the publishing industry and people were uncomfortable with it. And um, I've listened to these presentations with great interest, in part because I feel like if I were to use a, a metaphor for shifts in the music industry, for example, I feel like there are we've got a lot of loud music and that music that comes through technology that blares at you and yet you'll find often in a show there's that moment when there's the quiet song there's the ballad and there there are those lean in moments that really grab you and all the noise goes away and I feel like books for me growing up were that place and to some degree, I wonder, as we move into the future, whether they will still be that. Having listened to all of you speak, I feel like, wow, books are getting so complicated. Um, yes, we could have computers write poems, but why would we want to? <laughs> you know, we can have um, robots make music, and some people are doing that. I, Jaron Lanier, who is um, a very interesting thinker who people here may be familiar with, I used in a story I did about robotic orchestras. And uh, I, he said, well, yes, he's also a musician and a computer scientist. He says, yes, you could have computers make music for you, but you could have somebody have, you know, a robot have sex for you. Why would you want to do that? So I, I guess I, what the thing I want to kind of throw out at, at all of you in all of this noise and um, all the things you're talking about, about the future of books, do you think people still want, uh, you know, that lean-in experience, that moment of quiet? Uh, much of what I hear you talking about is very noisy. Does this, do you understand the question I'm, I'm asking? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I'm... I'm suspicious of, of, of ideas of kind of multimedia that imply there's a kind of greater noise or that or that adding other things to literature is, is um, in, in the experiential end, somehow additive. Um, I don't think putting a movie into a text or adding you know, a soundtrack to it is necessarily good. I think text works. Um, I, think, I think the discussion we're having today is, 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 is about the ways in which these things are produced. To a reader, it doesn't necessarily need to matter whether this text has been generated in, in various ways. But the text still works. It may not come in, in book form, but the reason text is successful is because it's of the work that happens in your own mind and the, and the reanimation of that process that really only happens with raw language. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure it's, it's too much for people to understand. I'm always suspicious when the idea is that there's somehow sort of too much information or overload. We've always been dealing with that. Uh, do, would, would others agree that you know, we've always been dealing with this level of overload? Is yeah. it just me? Yeah, you have, you have quotes from the like, 17th century after the Gutenberg Revolution, where you have people saying, "Oh, this is the end of the world. We are over overwhelmed. It's, it's, we won't deal with this kind of uh, level of information." And each time you have a sort of a technological revolutions like this, you can get this kind of uh, a feeling. But then, I mean, one, one of the questions I'm interested in is whether, uh, as you mentioned, whether people would be willing to, well, navigate through this uh, this noise. And I. Uh, I work with a, a publisher who's doing a science fiction and fantasy novel, and he, he told me recently that in his in his business, if the book is not is less than 500 pages, there's, there's no way it will sell. It, it should be 500 pages to 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 sell because the the audience uh, uh, they have mostly teenagers and and young people want to dig in this kind of very fascinating universe with very very thick books. So that that's a kind of a counter example that I found very intriguing. Uh, regarding all the discussion we have with text. Well, uh, no, I, I believe people do want to dig in. I mean, I'm saying I think they do. I think they want, I think they still want those moments. I'm not sure I'm happy to have all these, you know, to be able to click on a word and go to a whole other universe in the middle of a narrative. 
Um, and so, you know, and I think you were talking a little about that <laughs> earlier. I mean, do we, you know, maybe when I'm reading an article, but when I'm reading a narrative, do I really suddenly want to leave that narrative? It's difficult for me to, to express uh, in English. I, but um, I was very impressed by the path that uh, James has, has followed, uh, what he was telling, but the path as he was moving. And, uh, for me, the future of the book, uh, I don't bother really at all. For me, it's a, uh, it's a finished experience. Uh, it's, it's quite strange here. Yeah. In France, we have on uh, our campus, you have a University of Science and the University of Literature or of, of Law. It's completely separated. Here in Berkeley, uh, the world is together. But uh, yesterday evening in the French department, uh, there was a, a bust of Voltaire in bronze. So it's completely silly. <laughs> but uh, sure, there, was a, there were not data shows. Uh, um, I think uh, uh, there's, there's a huge gap between what we can experiment uh, each day uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, and we are completely fascinated, each of us, by what we can invent there and try, and try there. Um, and the, 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 the very slow path where literature has to be continued, as we was telling with the uh, uh, hard times of, of Dickens. And, and the gap is there, but we can't uh, go... This, there was a lady... About, uh, that's given a, a, a question about the young people and, uh, and empathy. Uh, we can't um, um, express ourselves um, with the reception of it. Uh, I, I just finished all, all that. Um, the, the experience of literature is very uh, um, it's primitive then. The, the, uh, each tool is, doesn't convince, uh, is not convenient but the, the reading experience is moving as well as we are conducting our writing experience uh, what is happening uh, uh, three weeks ago with, uh, uh, on the Kindle Fire with uh, the little glass <laughs> it's very strange you American think as a, a reader is a a, a guy with glasses. Pass it, Jeff Bezos. Yeah, the, the reader is a sort of. A, but uh, um, the Kindle Fire, the, the experience of reading uh, websites and e-books on Kindle Fire suddenly made a move. Uh, at the same time, uh, Apple is completely uh, leaving the, the experience of the iPad. Of the uh, e-books is always. Uh, Kitsch, uh, from, no, just to finish, um, this gap is, um, yes, it's a huge gap, but the reading experience is moving as well as our writing experience goes on. Uh, we can't, uh, yeah, it's primitive, but there is no other place. If, I think if we go to the research and laboratories, if we go to law laboratories uh, or science laboratories, engineering, you can't find any book there. The, the books are only in French departments. Uh, <laughs> so we have to go forward uh, and to, in, to invent. Uh, I can't uh, today, uh, uh, I'm, I try on my site to uh, to get my uh, yes 300 pages book how can i do uh, how can i get a reading experience with it on the web i don't know by then but i have to do it no other way sorry for the <laughs> well, yeah, and is, is is that a problem i mean J james mentioned this quote by uh, william gibson where he says mm -hmm. that uh, he is on top of uh, firefox looking for things and writing with that but our reading experience could be like that. Uh, you have people. Uh, I spend I spend time with people observing how they, they read using Kindle and iPads and tablets, and and they say things like, uh, "Okay, I read three lines and then I jump on Wikipedia and I jump." To some, uh, uh, I mean, of course, for me that's that's kind of weird, but that's their new kind of reading experience. It, it and, seems to be. Yeah. yeah and uh, yeah. Okay, do we have to judge that, or what can happen with this kind of reading experience? As what, what do you get out of the, the book? It might, it might be something different, simply, and, and that certainly changing the re changes the reading experience. But yeah, who am I to judge that? I don't know. No, I mean I can't I can't necessarily judge it. I just wonder that as, as human beings, I feel like we're wired for narrative. I mean, I've made my living in radio, and you know, <clears throat> one of the things I've always liked about it is it's a very intimate experience to tell somebody a story. Right, 
though I am allowed to use special effects and so forth, I think there's still something about us that likes to be just told a story. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you know, the next generation of people wants this experience where they're constantly jumping around. Um, and I'm curious if you have thoughts on that. Well, I think the, the, the experience of uh, reading a, a book, uh, we, we talked about that yesterday evening at the Swiss Next uh, Book Lab, um, uh, the experience of uh, reading a novel, for example, is a, is a, is a, is a it, you escape the, the, the noise, you, you, sorry, you escape the noise by reading a long form, a novel. Um, and it, you would not read the novel necessarily on paper, it's on a screen. And now if it's on a screen, we are connected uh, with, with other possibilities. And if I don't understand something in the book, so I could search for something. Or um, there, there will be something like social reading, social books, which means that I will be connected with other readers and what uh, what perhaps what they think uh, about a certain content, a certain chapter, a certain character, or just a certain line of a book. And, and I could switch it on. And immediately I am connected to what I call a content-trusted community, which is, uh, uh, which is working as a community behind a writer or behind a, just a, a book title. But the, the immediate experience of reading a book is, of course, you are uh, forgetting the noise around you if you just read the book. I guess the question is, is that an experience that's primarily over or a rather rarefied experience? I mean, you said don't judge it. I, I also but would, again, contend that it was never there entirely. Yeah. Like, there was no kind of magic golden age in which that was the case. Um, when Gibson talks about how he was not this stereotype of the hermetic writer and then he's constantly engaged with the network while writing, that goes true for the reader as well. You don't sit down and read a novel in you know, one long kind of flow. Yes, you may go and sit in a quiet place for a while, but it, that, that experience stretched over weeks in which you have many, many experiences. Uh, likewise, with the radio is a really good example. Um, very few people sit for even a half-hour radio program and listen to nothing else. Radio is the perfect, a wonderful medium for doing while you're doing something else. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and its history is, is I think, interesting in, in the form of the history of the book as well. Because radio went through like one of the most incredible kind of media mm. format changes with the advent of television, um, when basically you know, oh, suddenly you know we've got we've got pictures, and 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 there was this idea that like. Television was radio with pictures, which it's not. It's a different. It's a. It's a radically different thing. Just as you know, books aren't you know movies with words. It's. It's not. That's not how it works. Um, but also that the, this idea that television would sort of kill radio. Um, well, it didn't, of course. Radio just figured out new niches and, and new formats that it w that it would take and and, and new. Um, places and contexts in which it was worked, the shift of the radio from the kind of from the house into the car being a really kind of primary one that totally shaped it as a medium. Um, so the, these media are not fixed; they're not eternal. They never had a fixed form, uh, and and they're kind of constantly in flux. I think they've changed as they go through these these kind of um, format changes, kind of changed by the other technologies that grow up around them, and by our own the ways in which we are changed by those technologies. I mean, as a radio person, I would agree. You know, largely people said radio was dead, and it clearly isn't. Um, and usually what happens is new media join in, and the legacy media, older media, stick around, adapt, and create a different experience. Um, but, but I do wonder, I mean, do you, do whether or not I, uh, people agree whether or not we've ever, never had an experience of quiet reading, well, whether that, you know. But even, even the, the content, mm -hmm. if you, I mean, uh, novels like Thomas Pynchon or David Foster Wallace. I mean, with tons of uh, notes, footnotes everywhere. It's it's quite noisy uh, uh, as well. It's it's also well. I, I love it maybe because I grew up it's, with this kind of thing. It's perhaps just a false problem. I think uh, um, in two uh, two thousand four, on the the Mac has become the the OS ten system. And before we had. Uh, Word software. Um, only one software was possible. Uh, 
on the same day, of the, the, we, we can have a, a three or four, ten windows on our screen. Uh, nobody of us uh, c could have uh, imagined per advance what was the mental change of it. Uh, when I am with my students some weeks ago, um, yeah, there was one, he was connected and uh, chatting. And so so I, I told him, uh, please go to the library, uh, I need to concentrate. Monsieur, vous faites jamais deux choses en même temps, vous? Uh, don't you do uh, two things at the same time? <laughs> so, uh, and it was particularly dense. And so, uh, it's, it's not, when I read a book, I have my, uh, I have my, my note, I can do my note, I can speak to my friends, I can, uh, today when I read a, a paper book, because I don't have the, uh, the, the digital version, I put my iPhone on the book, and I need it to, uh, to have, uh, uh, to, to send my Twitter experience to the, <laughs> but is this a change? No. Um, would I you say as a radio uh, uh, personality, okay. sorry, would you say an audio book, hearing an audio book is reading a book? You know, it's, it's a somewhat different experience than reading. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not saying there ever was a pure time. I think there were some pure moments in my life of just reading a book. Um, I don't know that, you know, particularly when you're younger and you have less distraction and you can just go bury yourself in a book. But, um, you know, I don't know that young people are doing that right now. I think it's a different time. But I want to open it up to questions. I, I don't want to sound like a Luddite because I'm not. I actually <laughs> love all this stuff. I'm just asking these questions because I'm, I'm curious about the response. But I want to... <laughs> Um, it's, it's always good to get a rise out of people. Um, so if you guys have uh, questions... But nobody has our opinion about it. Yes. <laughs> it's moving on. So, um, right here. We have a mic for this. Well, it seems to me that <clears throat> one of the challenges that databases and other digital forms of cognition uh, offer to us as humans is whether or not our universe should continue to revolve around questions of meaning. So one way to think about narrative is that narrative <coughs> is a technology, a human technology to create meaning. But um, machines know nothing of meaning. And when you get hybrid machine human forms, such as Nicholas was talking about, you are confronted suddenly by the intrusion of non-meaning into meaning. And I'd like to hear the panelists' thought on whether this we should think of this as a challenge to the centrality of meaning to human life, or does it signal some kind of phase change into a deeper conjunction between the human and the non-human? Well... <laughs> Allez au boulot, Nicolas. <laughs> well, well, one of the reasons I mentioned the uh, machine-generated text is not necessarily that I think that this is I mean, the best type of text that can be produced, but what, what I find intriguing is that those robots, those programs, those algorithms, they're written by, by people, so there's always some human... I mean, type of intervention in, in, in this, and, and, and by using this notion of creolization, this sort of weird hybrid between cultural elements and technology, that actually leads me to contend this, this notion that there's no meaning in, in, in computer-generated things. There's always, I mean, those things have been designed, thought of by, by people. Of course, it might seem a bit weird and, and remote when I showed those, the list of codes that it's like, okay, there's no meaning in this, but there's actually a meaning. And once we decipher it, it requires time and effort. There's something intriguing that, that happens. On the other hand, I mean, of course, there's, I mean, if you have uh, glitches or problems because of the, the code, that's totally not understandable by, by, by people. And we, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about how we can adapt to that and how we can create meaningful control forms with this kind of things. I'm not sure that answer your question, but that's, that's just a way to take the problem in a different way. Yeah, there's, there's no way I'm going to fully answer that question either. Um, except, except to say that, like, that we talk a lot in absolutes that are always a bit wobbly, and narrative is like this grand human thing, and we all love it. And I think meaning, if we're going to do that, then at least put meaning as one of the things that we're pretty much, if we're hardwired for anything, is something that we're going to keep doing. We're, pattern recognition is sort of one of the essential 
things the human brain does even physiologically before you even start thinking about it. Um, but but I, I think what changes is not necessarily the search for meaning, but the ways in which we construct that meaning. So that the it's 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 no longer comes formed by kind of forms of of of, of authority and and notions of kind of singular truths either. Um, uh, but more that uh, there's a, a more diffuse um, appreciation of what the possible meanings are, uh, because we recognise that the uh, that various forms of authority which we've counted on to produce meaning in the past have, have broken down, and I'm kind of generally for that. Um, but uh, and so constructing meanings becomes more of an individual responsibility. Um, it becomes uh, removed from kind of institutions and, and larger uh, the ways in which meaning was produced in the past, and we enter a time of I think. A, a, a kind of intellectual precarity where we, we, we have to take a lot more responsibility for our own meaning production out of these things. Um, uh, the the, the, the grey areas of, of comprehension become a lot more visible because they're revealed by these network technologies. Again, I don't know what that means for us, um, but I'm also like it's, it's clearly the thing that we are constructing around ourselves in order to in some way better understand the world and ourselves. And I welcome that, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I would totally. No, I'm sorry. I, I would totally agree that stories we tell each other and, this, and, and the stories which survive tell us really truth about life and gives us meaning and gives us meaning as for our human, uh, yeah, for our life. And, is, and we are telling us stories uh, since hundred years, myth tales, which uh, tells us uh, about truth of life. And, but the data, uh, uh, I call it now, we could say the data uh, storytelling, uh, could be, uh, it reminds me of Dadaism. You know, it's, uh, it's, 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 you, you think it's meaningless, but it has a meaning. And which, by the way, Dadaism was invented in Zurich 100 years ago, uh, but in a, in a crisis situation. Uh, so if we lose sense of life because of the World War, one, uh, artists uh, uh, invented Dadaism because they didn't find any meaning during World War I. And so I think this is a kind of data, Dadaism. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, why not? Uh, and perhaps it uh, also shows us something about our society. Another question Hi. back here. Hi there. Oh, or, sorry. Uh -huh. you have I, I have two simple but related questions. Uh, first is, um, how important do you think it is to get low-cost electronic devices, screens, into the hands of the masses, a, a $20 Kindle, a $10 Kindle, a disposable Kindle? And number two, how important is it that you think that content should be free or shared? I know Martin said that um, we pay for stories, and that's fantastic, we do. However, not all of us can afford to pay for stories, and it used to be that a book was a physical uh, form that you could lend to someone, and that was one way of distributing ideas. And is that going to continue in the, in the digital age uh, where you share your Kindle book? I may have paid $3 for a Kindle book, but I can still loan that Kindle book to someone for two weeks. So I wanted to know what your thoughts are on free low-cost low devices and free content that is shared for those who can't afford it. Um, yeah, everything should be free. I mean, <laughs> if we're going to have that discussion, then, you know, so should electricity uh, and, and voting and, and, and all the kind of structures of society. Um, you know, yes, surely. Um, but, but given that that's not al always possible, I, I think there's, there's another way, I'm going to do this to you, to frame that question, uh, which is, is less about giving people the technologies, though that's important and an important part of this. Uh, my larger concern is actually how we, how we, um, how we share literacies in these things. Like it, it, the, you get in debates about which, which object or which form of storytelling should be used or what this kind of thing. For me, the, the far more important thing, and, and as, as I think there is a kind of a social prerogative behind the question you ask, um, that the, the actual good social work to be doing around this stuff is, is not necessarily in the material provision of these things, but in, in first figuring out and then teaching literacies in, in the systems behind them, whether that's, in, that's, that's just core language literacy, but also increasingly new forms of kind of systems literacy that allow people to be kind of full and, and um, uh, you know, um, uh, actors in the world now, uh, for which, in order to do so, you, you require not just the tools of this stuff, but an understanding of how it functions. 
um, that, in order to have any kind of agency in the contemporary world. I think that's the, that's the really important thing that needs to get mm. shared. Can I just add one laptop per child? I don't know if people, it was a failure. Largely because it was, it was, they gave it to these communities where that's not really what these communities needed at this point. I mean, I think, I think it will get to people. I mean, this is as a reporter who's sort of looked at this. All this stuff is going to get to people and probably in the form of like a mobile phone, actually, um, because that's what people around the world are getting. Um, as the question of content being free, I, I'm going to be quiet. I have a whole thought on that, but I want to let other people. I'm, I'm not the... The academic there, so. yes, I, I, I remember when it was in San Francisco in 1965, somebody asked to Bob Dylan, what is rock and roll for you? Carelessness. I think this, mm -hmm. this word, carelessness, it's, we can take it as a task. Uh, um, Flaubert, it uh, was uh, against the people who used uh, feather, uh, iron feather uh, instead of uh, uh, turkey feather. Uh, so for him, it was a, a, loss, a complete loss, a complete fall of literature, uh, because iron feather how to, to get the, the feeling of the hand. Uh, and when he goes to, to Egypt, he, he takes with him 120 uh, <coughs> turkey feathers just prepared, to, uh, because in Egypt, how can you find a, a good feather to write? Uh, for us, where are our tools to represent the world? Where are our tools uh, not to communicate? I hate that word, but uh, uh, to exchange. Uh, how to tell? I don't know James, but uh, he was sitting there before me. I, I tell her, "Wow, thank you, guy." <laughs> and uh, it goes with Twitter. What? It's marvelous. So we use this our tools. Our tools of today. Our tools are moving each uh, each week, uh, each month. Um, is it possible for us to? Uh, uh, literature and writing is what is our, our best. Our, our, uh, C'est tout ce qui compte. Uh, uh, how to, to deal with that, but uh, to be very light. I don't know how to express this. Uh, comment être léger avec ça. How to, to forget them, but to use them and the hell of the rest. Alors, c'était de l'américain à la fin. Um. I, I just I think our libraries in the future will be in the cloud, and I think there will something. Uh, it's uh, already. Uh, uh, it's already the cloud, but I think there will be something like uh, we will we will found an air and B for books. So I would to invite you <laughs> to use two weeks my library, and and perhaps uh, vice versa, and uh, or, a, or Netflix of books uh, with a flat rate. And I have success to access, so not access to, uh, to hundred thousands of book books for a flat rate. But um, it, it's not about owning things like DVDs, apartments, or, or books anymore. It's about sharing. And but of course we should pay uh, for the people who are producing, mm -hmm. uh, for the creative people who are producing uh, books. Yeah. But you don't have to pay for Sony for pay for. Universal or Bertelsmann. <laughs> and at the same time, there are completely. people who, who use BitTorrent and, uh, and knows how to find them. the people who read books and wants to have their e-books. They, they know where to find them for free. And uh, I don't necessarily mean that here that I, I'm, I'm in favor of this, but you have people who know how. It's happening. To, it's, it, it's really happening. Yeah. And, and it, I mean, the point here is not the technology. It's what James said about literacy, mm -hmm. and it's about well knowing how to find like books, music, in a way that, well, is responsible or not for artists. I mean, yeah, I, and I should say, and I, we have to wrap up, but, you know, the issue of libraries and e-books is problematic because of the intellectual property issues that are being fought right now um, and will, you know, I think to make books accessible is we have to work this issue out. It's a big one. So, um, but I think we have to wrap up. So um, I think it's lunchtime. You know, no. I don't want to stand between you and lunch. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and, you and very much. For it.